Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in this section we're going to talk about the real zeros of polynomial functions. This is part two of section 5.5. For a moment let's recall what we discussed in section 5.1. <clears throat> if we have a polynomial of degree n that means that there are n possible zeros. All right, now these may be real, they may be imaginary. We're going to stick with the real ones because that's what this section deals with. We'll deal with imaginary or complex solutions when we get to the next section. So what we have is a rule that was developed by Rene Descartes. Uh, it's called Descartes' Rule of Signs. Maybe you recognize the name. Our Cartesian coordinate system is also named after him. What he essentially uh, theorized was the number of positive real zeros that it, or an even integer less that a polynomial may have is the number of sign changes of f of x. So if we have a polynomial with different sign changes, maybe the first coefficient's positive, the next one's negative, that's a change in signs. And we'll see an example of that shortly. Then it has that many uh, real zeros or possible real rational zeros. So, we can actually go ahead and just look at a polynomial and say, well, these are the number of zeros that I'm looking for that are positive. Now, he also hypothesized that the number of negative zeros, negative real zeros, or an even integer less than that, is the number of sign changes of f of negative x. If we change the uh, input to be negative, how does that change the signs? And how many sign changes do we have? Now, this. The verbiage and wording of this may be a little bit confusing at this point, but when we see an example of it, hopefully it clears it up. We're actually just looking for the possible positive zeros and the possible negative zeros. So let's look at an example. If I have this polynomial, f of x equals negative x cubed minus x squared plus x plus 1, I want to find the possible positive zeros, the possible positive zeros. How many might there be if I go looking for them? Well, essentially, what Descartes says is all we have to do is assess the signs from left to right. It's negative. The next term is also negative, so it didn't change in sign. The next term is positive. We had a sign change here. So I have one sign change, and then it remains positive, so we only have one possible positive rational zero. So if we, or possible zero altogether. It doesn't even have to be rational, but hopefully we'll see in the next example that's what we're looking for is the rational ones to begin with. So we have one. It also said that it could be an even integer less. Well, an even integer less than one would bring me to negative one, which is not uh, possible. We can't have no or a negative amount of something. So one is the possible zero. This has one positive zero. And we can go looking for that, and we'll see how shortly. Well, what about the negative zeros? What about the values that might be zeros to the left of our y axis? Well, essentially what we do is we reassess the value for a negative value of x. Just plug this back into the function. Well, if I put a negative value into the first term, a negative cubed is going to change the sign. So that now it's positive x cubed. If I put a negative into the x squared, well, when I square a negative, it doesn't change the sign. It'd be positive, so this sign is negative. If I put a negative into this term, it's going to change its sign oh, to be negative. And then the constant, well, nothing's going to change the constant sign. So just by evaluating this function for a negative, we see the signs have done some changing. Well, let's look and see how many sign changes we have. This is Descartes' rules of signs. Well, this first term would be positive. Its coefficient is a positive 1. The next term is negative. We have a change in sign. So that's 1. And then the next term is negative. And then it changes sign again to the constant. There are two sign changes. So the number of negative zeros that I could possibly find are either 2 or an even integer less. Well, what's an even integer less than 2? That would be 0. We'll either find 2 or we won't find any. That's essentially what Descartes' rules of sign says. So why do we look at these sign changes? 
Well, it has to do with something called the intermediate value theorem. If we have some polynomial, and between some point A and some point B, we have a change in signs, one's above the axis, one's below the axis. If there's a change in sign, at some point, there must be a zero. It has to cross the axis in order to go from a positive to a negative or from a negative to a positive. That's the intermediate value theorem. If there's a change in signs, what we just looked at, there must be a zero. So if we look at this, we saw a change in signs when we were given the positive values for x's. There was one change in sign. There must be a real zero. If we put in a negative value and see what happens, we saw that there's two changes in sign. So there are two possible zeros or none. So that's what Descartes' rule of signs is. Now I can actually say, if I'm going to go looking for the zero, once I find one positive, I don't have to look anymore. If I'm going to find the negative zeros, if I find one, that means I must find the other, because there will be two of them. All right. If I go through it and I don't find any, well, that was a possibility as well. All right, let's look at an application of this. The first thing we want to recall is we have a polynomial, p of x, in descending order, where of degree n, the highest degree is listed first, and then it's in descending order. What we're going to look at is where do we start looking for these zeros? Well, what we can do is identify the leading coefficient, and we're going to call that leading coefficient q. Then we're going to look for the constant, this last number here. And we're going to call that p. So here's where it gets very important to watch your p's and q's. We're actually going to find the quotient of all the factors of p over q. The last coefficient over the uh, leading coefficient. So make sure you get that order right, otherwise you'll get it wrong. So let's, let's see how we can apply that to this. And we'll see all the factors of p over q are going to be my possible zeros. Now, f of x equals 2x cubed plus 11x squared minus 7x minus 6. Uh, maybe we recall this from the previous video. This is an example we worked on. And we used some synthetic division. But we're, we're going to look at this, and we're going to apply a different way to look at it. I want to see how many positive real zeros there are. Well, if I just look at it using Descartes' rule of signs, this coefficient's positive, this one's positive, and then we change to negative, and it stays negative for the next term. So we have one change in sign. So I am looking for one positive real zero. Now, how many negative real zeros can I have? Well, let's see. If I put in a negative value, I'm just going to evaluate this for f of negative x. And I really don't care about the quantities, just the signs. If I put in a negative, that changes the sign. So this first term would be negative. If I put in a negative here, I square a negative doesn't change the sign. It's going to remain positive. If I put in a negative here, a negative times a negative is going to give me a positive, And this sign doesn't change. Well, let's look at this. A negative changes to a positive. That's one sign change. It remains positive. It changes back to a negative. That's my second sign change. So that tells me, according to Descartes' rule of signs, that there are either two or an even integer less, zero. So there are either two or zero negative real zeros. So what we want to do is we want to find the rational zeros. If this contains rational zeros, they will be of the factors p over q, and all the factors, both positive and negative. So let's find p over q for this polynomial. Well, my p value is the constant, negative 6 over my q value, the leading coefficient, is 2. And we call it q because it's a quotient, so we put it in the denominator. And now I just want to write out all the possible factors. Well, what are all the possible factors of 6? Well, we could have plus or minus 1. We could have plus or minus 2 because it's evenly divisible by 2 plus or minus 3, evenly divisible by 3, 
and plus or minus 6. So these are all the factors of p over all the factors of 2. Well, we could have plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2. Those are all the factors of 2. Now, this is where the work may become tedious, but we're essentially, I'm just going to rewrite these as this quotient, as these rational values. Well, 1 over 2, I could have plus or minus 1 half. 1 over 1 is just 1, plus or minus 1. I could have 2 over 1, which is plus or minus 2. I could have 2 over 2, which is plus or minus 1. I already have that. I could have uh, 3 over plus or minus 2, which is plus or minus 3 halves. And I apologize for not putting them in uh, increasing order. Plus or minus 3 over 1 is plus or minus 3. Plus or minus 6 over 1 is plus or minus 6. Plus or minus 6 over 2 is going to be 3. And we already have that value. So the last one is plus or minus 6. So these are all the different possible rational zeros. Now, do I have to test all of these? I could. I could use synthetic division and test positive 1 half, negative 1 half. I could test positive 1 and negative 1, and positive 2 and negative 2, and so on. But if I find just one of these to be positive, I have found the one I'm looking for. There won't be any others. Because Descartes' rule of science says if you find one, you don't have to continue looking. You've already found it. And if it's rational, it will be in this list, which is actually good news. Now, if I'm looking for a negative 0, well, it's, if it's rational, it's going to be in this list of numbers. Maybe it's negative 1 half, or negative 1, or negative 2, or so on. If I find one of them, that means I have to continue looking to find the other. If I, don't, if I go through it and test all of them up to the second to the last one, and I say, oh, I didn't find any, well, the last one's not going to be one either. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to throw it into a calculator just to narrow it down. Because you know, for time's sakes, I'm not going to test all of these. And if you graph this function right here into a graphing calculator, and look, where does it possibly uh, cross the x-axis, where are those zeros, because that's what we're looking for, you'll see that it crosses at negative 6, or it appears to cross at negative 6. It appears to cross at negative 1 half. And it appears to cross at positive 1. Well, there's the 1 positive and the 2 negatives. They were in that list, and they would be our zeros. Now, let's make sure, because maybe our calculators, maybe we're not zoomed in, we don't have the proper window, so we're not seeing what we need to see. Let's test these. Let's actually use synthetic division, the tool we discussed in the previous video, to see if these are, in fact, zeros. So uh, the first one I'm going to do is the positive one. So I'm just going to do synthetic division by 1. And I say, OK, my coefficient is 2. My coefficient is 11. My coefficient is negative 7, and my constant is negative 6. And we're going to do synthetic division to see, is this, in fact, the 0 of this polynomial? So we bring down the first value. 1 times 2 is 2. 11 and 2 is 13. 1 times 13 is 13. 13 and negative 7 is a positive 6. 1 times 6 is 6. Negative 6 and positive 6 is 0. That is great news. That means that this has no remainder, so it is, in fact, a factor. So I know that x minus my 0, 1, is a factor of this quantity. I found the positive 0 to be 1. 1 minus 1 makes this 0. Now, the remaining value is 2x squared plus 13x plus 6. Now, once I got it down to this point, maybe I could find the other zeros by factoring or using quadratic methods. But let's continue the division, because these are going to be my other zeros. So let's, let's do synthetic division on this value. Once we've factored it out, we just have to work with what's remaining, because this times that is the original function. So this is a piece or a factor of the original function. So I'm going to use synthetic division to take out negative 6. So I have coefficients of 2, 13, and 6. 
and let's see what happens. I bring that 2 down. Negative 6 times 2 is negative 12. 13 and negative 12 is a positive 1. Negative 6 times 1 is negative 6. 6 and negative 6, great news. We have 0. So now this is 1 factor of x less here, 2x plus 1. This is my last factor. So this was evenly divisible. So x minus a negative 6 is another factor. Well, what's my last factor? I don't have to go anymore because this is, in fact, a linear factor, 2x plus 1. Now, if I were to take these values, and I'll just write them over here, x minus 1 times x plus 6 times 2x plus 1. And if we look at this, what's the 0 of this? Well, I didn't do synthetic division because this, if I solve this for 0, negative 1 over 2, negative 1 half makes this 0. And that was what we would have seen if we would have graphed this. So this is now the same thing as the original polynomial, except I was able to break it down into its linear factors in order to find those zeros. So this 0 is 1, negative 6, and negative 1 half. And let's just go back for a moment and review. Descartes' rule of science says I would find one positive 0, which I did. It also said I'd find two or zero negative zeros. Well, this value is negative 6. That was a, uh, a negative 0. And this one was negative 1 half. That was the other negative ve value. So I found one positive and two negatives. All right, so let's do it one more time so that we can see how we solve these polynomials. All right, and I'm going to use red this time. All right, first thing we want to do is use Descartes' rules of science. How many possi possible positive zeros am I going to find? Well, let's look at these sign changes. We have positive to negative, that's 1, and then it remains negative. So I'm only going to find one possible real 0. That's positive. What about the negative real zeros? Well, if I put in a negative, this changes the sign. Put in a negative, it stays negative. Put in a negative, it changes the sign. And the constant isn't going to change sign. So if we look at this, it's negative. It changes to positive, and then it changes back to negative. So I'm looking for 2, or an even integer less, 0. So what are these possible uh, things that I could test? Well, we use p over q. This is our p, and this is our q, right? our constant over our leading coefficient. So I have negative 5 over 2. So I'm just going to write out all the factors. Well, this isn't so bad. The factors of positive or of negative 5 are plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 5. The factors of this are plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2. These are the factors of 2. Negative 1 times negative 2 is 2. Positive 1 times positive 2 is also 2. And now I'm just going to rewrite this. I could have plus or minus a half, this over that. I could have plus or minus 1. I could have plus or minus, uh, what, 5 halves? Or plus or minus 5. All right, well, that's not so bad. There are eight different values. These two, these two, these two, and these two. Well, let's go ahead and start looking for them. Let, instead of using synthetic division, this time we're going to use something we talked about in the last video, because we want to find out what are the factors. We can use the zero factor theorem, which basically, or the zero remainder theorem, excuse me. We can basically just plug in these values, and if it makes this a true statement, that is my zero. So let's try that. Let's, let's start with. Uh, 1 half, if, because I'm looking for 1, and I know I'm going to find it if it's rational here. So if I put in 1 half here, let's just do it over here. 1 half cubed is 1 eighth times 2 is a quarter. 1 half squared is a quarter times negative 3 is negative 3 quarters. A half times negative 3 is negative 3 halves minus 5. Well, a quarter minus 3 quarters is a negative 1 half, 
Negative 1 half minus 3 halves minus 5, well, that's not going to give me 0. That doesn't equal 0. I don't even have to continue it. I know it's not 0. So this 1 half is not going to find me that positive 0. Well, let's try 1. If I put 1 in here, I get 1 cubed is 1 times 2. 1 squared is 1 times negative 3. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. And then we have our negative 5. Well, if I look at this, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Negative 1 minus 3 is obviously not equal to 0. I could try 5 halves. Well, for time's sake, let's try 5, because that'd be an easy number. 5 cubed is 125 times 2 is 250. Uh, 5 squared is 25 times negative 3 is negative 75. 5 times 3 is negative 15. And negative 5, if I just look at that, guess what? That's not equal to 0 either. All right, well, let's go ahead and try that positive 5 halves. 5 halves cubed is going to give me 125 eighths over 2, or well, times 2 would give me 125 fourths. 5 halves squared is 25 fourths. Oh, actually, this would be, oh no, that's right. That's right, times 2. 5 halves squared would be 25 fourths times negative 3 would be negative 75 fourths. And then we have 5 halves times negative 3 is negative 15 halves. And then minus 5. Well, let's see if this holds true. 125 minus 75 would be 50 fourths, which reduces to 25 halves. 25 halves minus 15 halves is going to give me uh, 10 halves. And 10 halves is 5. 5 minus 5 is, in fact, 0. So this is the true statement. So positive 5 halves is my 0. So we have x minus 5 halves. 5 halves is my 0 here. So now that I know that this is a factor, I could go ahead and find the other ones as well by testing them. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use synthetic division at this point. I already found that this is, in fact, a 0. So let's use synthetic division. Let me uh, move that down a bit. Of 5 halves, my 0. Now let's use these coefficients. 2, negative 3, negative 3, and negative 5. And when we use synthetic division, now yes, it's a fraction, but don't fret. It's not too bad. Bring down the first one. 2 times 5 halves is 5. Negative 3 and 5 is going to give me positive 2. 5 halves times 2 is 5. Negative 3 and 5 is a positive 2. 5 halves times 2 is 5. Negative 5 plus 5 is 0. So yep, we got a 0 remainder because that was, in fact, our 0, right? So now this is x squared, and this is x, and this is our constant. So now I could solve this using quadratic methods. So I know this is a 0. I could find the other zeros. Well, <clears throat> if we set this equal to 0, and I'm just going to do that right up here, x squared or 2x squared plus 2x plus 2 equals 0. Well, I can factor out a 2, and that's going to give me x squared plus x plus 1. And now I could solve this in uh, using a quadratic method, right? Well, let's do that. Let's, let's just use a quadratic formula, because the coefficients are real nice. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, which is 1 times 1, so it's just that. And we notice, well, that's negative. That's imaginary. Well, that imaginary solution, well, what does that tell me? It says my negative zeros, none of them would have worked. And that's why I didn't test that first. I tested the real ones, because I'm going to find one rational zero. These are imaginary. Now, when we get into the next section, we'll actually learn how to deal 
with these in the complex number system, these negative solutions or square roots of negatives, right? Something we're familiar with, but now we're going to see it in higher order polynomials. So that's just a little precursor to the very next section, our complex zeros of polynomials. This has been section 5.5, part two. Thank you for watching.